Jess Diner, it's great to see you. How are you? Hello, I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Very well. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is the one and only Jess Diner, who is British Vogue's beauty and lifestyle director. It's a real privilege to get to speak to you today, Jess, and of course, a member of St. John's Wood Synagogue. So, uh, Jess, if you could tell us very briefly a little bit about yourself in 60 seconds for our audience. Oh my gosh, 60 seconds. Okay, so yes, um, beauty and lifestyle director at British Vogue, mum of two boys, um, member of St. John's Wood Shaw, as you said. Um, I have worked at Vogue for probably gosh like on and off 15 years so basically all my working career I've pretty much been there save a brief stint somewhere else um but yeah it's an amazing amazing job um lots of fun never a dull moment lots of excitement but yeah it's it's an incredible uh place to work well, tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day job what does your career involve and um what are you doing between nine and five well, what I'm, what I'm doing between nine and five now is very different to what I would normally be doing nine to five. So nine to five at the moment, I'm basically sat in this room um, on Zoom calls all day, um, pretty much just checking in with the team, brainstorming ideas with them. Um, so I oversee all of the beauty and lifestyle. So that's wellness, mental health, um, physical health, fitness. Um, anything to do with kind of our minds and bodies. Um, I oversee all of the content for both online and print. So um, the day is kind of structured in two ways. We have a morning check-in with just the beauty and wellness team and we brainstorm the ideas for online and what we're writing about that day. Um, but then throughout the week, I have check-ins with the print team. So that's kind of the wider team, heads of department of all the different departments um, and my boss just planning um, for the print magazine. And at the moment, we're kind of working on May, um, April and May issues. So we kind of work three to four months in advance. So the day is always quite higgledy piggledy because you're working in the here and now and there's sort of content for online, but you're also forward planning um, well into 2021. So your brain has to be kind of compartmentalized. But um, if we were in the office, we'd obviously be doing all of that in person, but then we'd have the kind of added excitement of product launches, um, shoots, but all of that obviously can't happen at the moment. So we're just doing the best that we can um, on Zoom um, and just trying to keep things exciting and fresh as much as possible. Well, I hope it's okay with you. I want to use this opportunity to do a bit of brainstorming with you as well, because as a rabbi, it's very important to uh, dress appropriately. And I was actually a bit nervous which tie to choose today for this. <laughs> I went with a, with a very traditional one. I'd like some- Excellent uh, choice. Some fashion advice and fashion tips. Perhaps this could be a featured article in Vogue, how to be a fashionable <laughs> rabbi. And um, I've actually- I'm sure it would be very high performing content. A few of my favorite ties to ask- So the colorful <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm quite, uh, the colourful one's very optimistic, very spring, summer 21. We saw a lot of bright colours on the catwalk. Um, My wife hates that yeah. one. Fine, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Dina. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's but the one you've miserable. gone with today is, is wonderful. The one I've gone with today. You know, it's a funny yeah. thing. There was a remarkable interview with Rabbi Lord Sachs um, with Tim Ferriss, who um, is a very famous interviewer in, in the US. And his first question was to Rabbi Sachs, why do you always wear yellow ties? Because Rabbi Lord Sachs was famous for his yellow ties. And Rabbi Sachs responded and said, because one of the jobs of a rabbi is to brighten up people's lives and to raise people's spirits. So it's, it's quite interesting. Even Rabbi Lord Sachs, of uh, blessed memory, he took this really seriously. Yeah. And he always looked so sophisticated, so elegant and so suave. Um, and that's really uh, an important aspect of being a rabbi, I guess. Mm. Yeah, so there you go. It can be the inspiration. Let me ask you this question on a more serious note. Um, I understand you completed your conversion to Orthodox Judaism in 2013. Could you tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey? What compelled you to convert? <clears throat> tell us a little bit about that incredible chapter of your life and journey that you took. It's funny that you asked me about it, actually, because it was my Jewish birthday on Friday. So um, I feel very lucky because I have my regular birthday and then um, that's in July. And then I also have my Jewish birthday, which is in November. So um, it's kind of been something that I've been reflecting on a lot recently because of my birthday, but also I wrote a piece about it for Vogue for our November issue. Um, I don't know, it's our October issue actually, um, about the whole journey. So it's kind of something that I've been reliving and re-experiencing quite a lot recently. So yeah, it was in 2013, as you said, but there was kind of a lifetime of build-up uh, to it. Um, I mean, shameless plug, 
the detail is all in the piece if you want to read it it's on the Vogue website right now um but kind of in a nutshell my father's American my mum is French we were living in America and we relocated here when I was around four we relocated to the UK for my dad's job um and we had been living in New Jersey when we were in the States and um so when we were relocating my dad was like I don't mind where we live but I just want to live in like a nice suburb area something that's similar to kind of like the UK equivalent of New Jersey so um his work placed us in Hampstead on suburb obviously Jewish heartland territory all of our neighbors were Jewish um all the the kids in my class were Jewish you know we very much sort of immediately were thrust into the Jewish community and the Jewish community being as welcoming as they are we were constantly at invited Friday night dinners Rosh Hashanah meals Seder nights you know it was very much like part of my upbringing as a child experiencing these things with my friends and my family friends so you know that kind of was always sort of part of my life from the get-go and then um I you know as by proxy of a lot of my friends being Jewish um I met Ed who is now my husband um and you know I'm always sort of very keen to clarify that I didn't do it just to get married to him I feel like my life was always leading up to this but he was definitely meeting him was kind of catalyst to start looking into conversion um and everything that entailed um and so I kind of applied through the Beth Din to do the orthodox conversion and um it was you know I think it was probably like three years took me to complete it um and here we are thank god lovely family two kids later um and it's one of those things that when you're going through it and you're you're living it it kind of it takes up every minute every thought of your day um and then and this is what we were reflecting on recently and then you kind of complete your conversion you have this you know certificate that says I'm Jewish um from the Beth Din um and then it's almost like by osmosis you're just living this life that you feel like you're always supposed to be living um and it just feels so normal and so even to talk about it sometimes I'm just a bit like oh yeah because it you know my sort of Jewishness has just become so um ingrained into everything that we are as a family so um, but yeah, it was an amazing thing to go through. I could talk about it for ages. It's amazing to hear your journey and I'd love to hear more. But what I find fascinating is that your career in Vogue, um, mm. I mean, Vogue is obviously a monthly fashion magazine. It's a lifestyle mm. magazine. Mm. You cover many topics, I'm sure, including fashion and beauty and culture and living, et cetera, et cetera. And as you went on that journey to become Jewish, I'm sure you came across conflicts between mm. the spirituality of your faith and the kind of materialism of the world of Vogue. And Mm. Was there a conflict? How did you manage to kind of resolve those conflicts in, in every aspect of your life, in the way you dressed, in your work? How did you Yeah. I think for me, I, I never found a conflict. And, you know, obviously I'm kind of more in the beauty and lifestyle space. So, um, you know, obviously Vogue is a fashion magazine. It's, you know, that's, that's kind of like its DNA. But um, it's always kind of meant much more than that. And I think Vogue in itself is is kind of like this aspirational cultural beacon um, that even if people don't read it, they've kind of heard of it. And I've it's kind of weird because I've always had a job that I've never had to really explain where I work. Like, oh, what do you do? I work for a magazine. You know, which magazine? Vogue. Oh, you know, you kind of never really have to explain it. People kind of have always heard of it, even if they've never, um, even if they've never read it. So, but you no, know, for me, there was, there's never really been a conflict because, um, especially going back to, so, so, so to backtrack a bit, when I was um, converting the whole time, I was still working there. Um, and I have to say, like Vogue, it's an incredible place to work because of what it represents. But I think for me, it's really the people um, that are just, incredible and you know when I told my boss at the time that I was I was going on this embarking on this process on this journey it, there was never any question and it was like you know I'm gonna have to leave early on a Friday and you know in the winter that's gonna be at lunchtime because I have to be home well before you know there was never any question it was always like um they really champion the individual and that you're not put in a box it's just very much like everyone is allowed to be um themselves so there was never any conflict from that kind of physical logistical side of me embracing Judaism and you know obviously that still continues I still leave um uh, or I suppose now I'm at home but I can't you know I'm logging off early on a Friday and so there hasn't been that kind of logistical conflict um and then I suppose you know in in terms of how I dress 
Um, luckily, it's very fashionable to dress modestly these days. But, um, you know, again, it's just everyone is very much like does their own thing. So um, I feel like if anything, it's been celebrated. So the fact that my boss asked me to write a piece about my conversion, I've written about dressing modestly for the magazine many times before, both online and in print. So I think, you know, for me, um, it was a real support system, actually. Um, it, it was then when I was converting and it very much is now. So I've never found it to be a conflict, actually, but more um, a, a support system. You know, let, let's just talk a little bit about modesty from a Jewish perspective, because a lot mm. of the audience watching this and uh, members of our community f find it sometimes to understand why Judaism is so strict when it comes to modesty. We know it's based on the Pasuk and Micha, the to, to kind of walk discreetly with God. And you, you spoke mm. about this idea of individuality as well, but focusing mm. more on the inner individuality. And I think people mm. often make a mistake with Judaism that think we're not into beauty, we're, it's not important to us. And it's so not true. I mean, the Talmud, yeah. there's a famous Gemara in Brachas where Rabban Gamliel, who was one of the sages of the, um, of the, in the second century, he, he describes a blessing that you make upon seeing a beautiful person. Uh, we know yeah. the verses in Psalms that talks about um, the, beauty, the, in, the inside beauty, et cetera, et cetera. How do you kind of make modesty fashionable and, and keep it that way and kind of, you know, when you're talking to a teenage audience or a younger audience, yeah. how you kind of explain to those younger girls and boys that w the way you dress is so important and you don't need to compromise your fashion by dressing modestly. I think um, everything you just said, it just is so spot on. And for me, when I was learning about Judaism in general, but mo modesty specifically, um, it was kind of flipping this notion on its head. So rather than focusing on what you can't do, focus on the positives and focus what you gain from it so um i think it's this this idea even um when you think about shabbat like you, people ask you about shabbat or they ask you about modesty like what can't you do there's so much focus on what you can't do what can't you wear what can't you do you mean you don't get to wear jeans or you know you don't wear short skirts but um for me it's kind of flipping it on its head and being like well you know talking about Shabbat it's looking at celebrating all of like the family time and the positives and being able to turn your phone off and um you know having undivided attention with your family with friends with yourself you know having like a bit of peace of mind for yourself and then when it comes to dressing um you know you can I think I said it in the piece actually but um you know it's about looking attractive not attracting and I think there's such beauty in um in a sort of quiet confidence and it's not about um i've never been one of the mentality of shouting the loudest i've always felt very quietly confident in myself and that's always what i try to sort of pass on to other people it's just not following the crowd not feeling like you have to fit in but doing what feels right for you and having that quiet confidence that when you're doing things for the right reasons um it will always pay off nice. and you can still look good in the process there's nothing to say. It has to be like frumpy or unattractive. Sure. I think and that's that, always what I try to sort of push. Modesty extends to so much more than just what you wear. It's the way you behave. It's your manner of speech. It's your, it's your it's attitude. Exactly. Your it's, your, it's your whole um, aura, your whole being. And I think, um, I think also there's so, much, um, there's so much beauty in that. And I think, it, yeah, I don't know. I kind of, um, I always try to pass that on because I just think um it's such a, a lovely attitude but like from a holistic perspective not just from sort of the physical of how you look and it's funny because even um you know since I since I wrote that piece so many people are like oh so that's why you wear dresses you know it's always it's not always like something that I sort of readily talk about it's just very much like I just always dress like this and then you know for all the people that have ever asked me like why I only ever wear midi dresses now you know but um I think that's that's again that's part of the beauty of it it's just you know for people to very kindly think that I sort of dress nicely but this happens to be the reason um I think you know that's there's something quite lovely in that well, and of course, we know royalty, they all dress modestly. And, and that's an interesting aspect. Of, of this is it. I mean, Kate Middleton was a big inspiration at the time. Um, I, I always thought she just dressed so elegantly and so beautifully. Um, and um, even like, you know, going back to work and fashion uh, at the time when I was converting, it was very much about like the high collar, the long sleeves, you need to go into the, the high street, there's so much option. And it's just about finding the right things that work for you. I'm sure in your line of work, you must have the opportunity to meet lots of interesting people, celebrities, famous people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, it's funny because um, it's a question I get asked a lot. You know, what celebrities have you met? And I've kind of, a lot of celebrities have fragrance lines or makeup lines. So, you know, I've met Rihanna and Britney Spears and Kim Kardashian and um, Sarah Jessica Parker. So a, a lot of people kind of like culturally who are considered a big deal. Um, but I'm always like a bit blasé by that because of the whole celebrity thing doesn't faze me. But um, I was once invited to have a kind of meet and greet and cup of tea with Leonard Lauder, who is um, a descendant of the very famous Estee Lauder. He is CEO of the company in the US, like he's such a big deal. So I was kind of honored with the opportunity to meet him um, with my boss. Um, and, you know, that in itself to be with like those two kind of power players in the industry was just quite an incredible moment. Um, and Mr. Leonard is, um, Mr. Lauder is Jewish. And um, we, there is that kind of like quiet connection with people that you have yeah, when you, you get the no one saying Yeah, it. it's like, um, we're not going to explicitly discuss this, but like there's a connection. So anyway, you know, we were like chatting, we had a wonderful time. He was telling stories. Um, to us because he's, he's the most he's very known for his stories he's the most incredible storyteller and um, we were with him for an hour we were kind of like given that time and you know upon the hour it was like okay right well I've got to go to my next meeting um, and during the course of the, our time together I'd tell him about my children their names are Noah and Jacob so you know there's that kind of we kind of had a few things like a mention of Hanukkah that was coming up and um, and then he just kind of turns to me and he's like he says to my boss, who is like obviously a very eminent man in the industry, he's like, she's one to watch. He's like, you know, she, she's the next big deal. And I'm kind of like, thank you, thank you, Mr. Lauder, thank you. And he said, um, anytime you come to New York, you've got to come to my office. You've got to look me up. Um, I would love to show you my office. And he's got like Picassos and like all these incredible um, art is very much his thing. He's got this incredible artwork in the office. And I said, oh, absolutely, Mr. Lauder, thank you so much. It would be like such an honor and such a pleasure. And he just slapped me on the shoulder and he was like, call me Lenny. <laughs> so, and then, so now it's like Lenny Lauder, you know, I would never in a million years call him Lenny, but, um, you know, just like I have these moments now where I'm like my call me Lenny moments. And it's just <laughs> something that I like to say with the team. And like, if I want to channel my kind of like inner CEO, I just need to be a bit more Lenny Lauder. But yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, that was a very long winded story to say that he's great story. Probably, great story. Um, but he's just an incredible businessman. And he's, you know, well into his 80s, maybe almost even 90. He's just um, an incredible man in the industry and like a big family man. Um, and yeah, he's quite. It's an interesting thing. You know, we live in a celebrity culture and mm -hmm. a lot of people are obsessed by image. People are obsessed by the way they look, the way they dress. And mm. you know, it's, it's really a problem with the younger generation, particularly TikTok, Instagram, um, yeah. Snapchat. How do we kind of make sure that we focused on being attractive without being attracting, with a, mm. a la without allowing this taking over our life? How do we make sure that teenagers don't grow up with this kind of focus on, 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 on vanity? Yeah, thing is, it's so hard. And I, I always think about that. And especially having my own kids, I just think about like, what are they, what is social media going to be like when they're kind of teenagers? And I think I come from, or we come from the last generation that didn't grow up with social media. It's something that we adopted. So I find it quite easy to just switch in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so kind of, you know, I see with my nieces, like how it's very much like integrated into their everyday life. And so my key thing is just to know to switch off and everything that you see, like is just this glossy version of reality. And I know that everyone says it, but that really is the truth that what you see is not what you get. Um, on social, everything is through like the veneer of Instagram, the veneer of like dance routines on TikTok, but that's not the reality of what people are living. Um, and it's just what they choose to present. So, um, you know, like I'm very much like I hold my hand up. I very much am a proponent of that, but I also try to filter in or like pepper in moments of reality because I just think it's not responsible to only present this like glossy version of life. Um, but what I personally try to do is minimize my time online. Obviously, um, being observant, we have that beauty that you can just switch off. So I think mentally it's easier to switch off at other times in the day as well but I'll only look at Instagram in the morning and in the evening so in the day I'm just not on it because it's just it can just completely take over your life so um, my advice is just to not get too wrapped up in it and understand that what you see is not always what you get.
No, absolutely. And th this is part of the, the Jewish ancient wisdom. You know, in Pirkei Avot, we say, don't look at the container, but rather what's inside. Look at the, the internal um, focus, the internal beauty. Um, don't be, you know, when you look at a container full of old wine as opposed to new wine, it's the old wine that has the timeless beauty and, and, and try and focus on that. Um, and there's so much more to say on this subject of beauty. You know, even the, the mitzvah of an etrog, an etrog on, on Sukkot, this is one times in the Torah that we describe it to be a beautiful tree. And the commentators explain what's so beautiful about the, the etrog. It's something that hangs on the tree through all the seasons, through the whole year, through the rain, through the sunshine, through the cold, through the heat. It's something that's timeless. And that's, that's the idea of Jewish beauty, something that endures and it's not superficial. Tell me something, how, how do you balance um, a demanding job and being a Jewish mom, running a Jewish home, and, and tell us a little bit of your insight and perspective on work-life balance generally. I mean, I think it's less balance, just more trying to keep everything together, like the juggle. Everyone always, like, we always say the juggle is real. It's just like keeping all the balls in the air. And actually, um, I don't know if you can hear my kid, like, screaming in the background. He's very resistant uh, to his lunchtime nap. Um, I think... Um, just juggling it all it's just every day is different and like sometimes you drop the balls and that's absolutely fine um I don't think everyone can be everything to everyone all at the same time so it's just knowing um knowing what your strengths are knowing when to prioritize things um I think um you know working from home actually has been an incredible gift on the work life balance because I can work all the way up until bedtime and then I don't have to worry about the commute I can just literally run into the kids bed their dreams and put them to sleep um it's kind of given me real extra time with my kids which has been incredible so i think it will be when we go back to the office just knowing how to manage that again um and how to to maintain that balance because it has been um incredible being able to be around with the family more um and then also you know from a jewish perspective i think um I work full time. So it's just about being really organized. I mean, you all know, so many people watching will know that kind of countdown to Shabbat on a Friday. You're kind of like, it's always a mad panic, no matter how, how you plan panic. it. You can be so methodical and think you've thought everything through. There's always going to be that last minute curveball. So, um, you know, like from a work perspective, I'll always say to my team in the morning, I'm online until 3 p.m. today. Anything you need me to do needs to be in by lunchtime. Then I'll have time to do it. Beyond that, it'll have to wait till Monday. Um, and then I've got an incredible uh, deputy who basically will handle everything while I'm offline. But yeah, you can try and be organized, but life has a good way of throwing you curveballs. Can I ask you who's your greatest role model and inspiration? Apart from Ed, obviously. Well, I mean, I'd have to say Ed. Well, it's actually really funny because my husband's called Ed and my boss is called Ed. So easily confused. I feel like I always have to clarify boss <laughs> Edward, not husband Edward. Or like not text one instead of the other on my phone. Um, biggest inspiration. I think it would. I would be remiss to not say um, the rabbits then that I learned with during my conversion because she's still a very close friend, um, Ruthie Halberstadt. She um, is just the most incredible person, and she's kind of like taught me a lot about who I am um and um she taught me like the nuts and bolts of everything but um sort of on a more spiritual level too I think that she's incredible Fantastic. so I want to shout out to her well, it's an inspiration to speak to you uh incredibly successful person who manages to juggle everything uh, family Sometimes. career and please god we should learn from you any last fashion tips for the rabbi Whatever you're doing is working. Just don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just, <laughs> just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. Thanks so much, Jess Dina, and wishing you all the very best. Thank you so much for having me.